Um, I'd like to talk to you uh, for a little while about the work of the Evidence Group, which is part of UKIS and was established following um, Professor Tanya Byron's recommendation that all of UKIS's work should be evidence-based uh, in a variety of ways. And the Evidence Group has been working um, over the last few years, there are several of them uh, here in this room, um, to work on a research strategy for UKIS and advise on its priorities, and especially to establish the evidence base. Uh, and in this, we've been working with the other UKIS champions, the working groups, and really trying to keep a, a watching brief on the array of research that is going on, um, some of it in this country, some of it uh, in other countries, to try and identify what are the kind of key uh, insights, the key evidence, and the key messages that can inform the work of the UK Council for Child Internet Safety and all of the stakeholders that it works with and represents. Um, so one of the ways we've been working, um, I don't necessarily expect you to read all those words in uh, detail, but they are um, in the packs that you've all received. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is trying to identify where is the research, um, who is doing uh, what kinds of research, and we've been trying to identify the key messages within that research that is relevant to UKIS. So as um, I'm sure you're all aware, research reports tend to be very long and very detailed, and they're not always uh, full of information which is directly relevant to the question of internet safety. Uh, we've been trying to kind of identify what are the key parts of it that UKIS needs to know about and that this wider stakeholder group needs to know about. And so we've been looking at the array of publicly available, high quality research uh, starting in this country. And so, so far over the past year, we've identified 15 pieces of work. You can see the kinds of bodies on the right-hand side who are producing this research, uh, and on the left-hand side, the kinds of issues that have been tackled. So the work that uh, Chris Willard talked about from Ofcom is in there, the work that I've been doing for EU Kids Online, whose reports are upstairs, um, if you want them, is also in there, and a whole range of other kinds of research studies that are going on. What I thought I'd do in the few minutes that I have with you today is just to bring out from those summary accounts, from those highlights, some of the key messages that the evidence group thinks uh, this group might find interesting and useful uh, in developing its further work uh, and policy initiatives. So I've got three slides. They've all got a lot of words on them because I'm a researcher, but there are only three of them, I promise. Uh, and they try and draw out what those key messages can be. So first, I think as has been, oh, now I want to go backwards. Can I go backwards? Yes. Ah, I've only got one green button. <laughs> I'm not being dense. This has got a very simple affordance. Um, this is a context of rapid change. I think uh, this has been said several times today already, and it will carry on being um, uh, a very important and very challenging thing for those of us trying to work to make the internet safer for children. And as many would like to emphasize, and the evidence group too would like to emphasize, the primary story about the internet is about benefits, is about opportunities. But within that wider uh, array of um, beneficial change, we must also focus on questions of risk and safety. Um, I also don't expect you to read the little highlights, but uh, as a researcher, I like references. And I just want to say, behind each of these summary points, there are the, the research highlights, which are numbered, and behind those, there are very detailed research reports. So this is a kind of a terrible um, synthesis without uh, qualifications and elaboration. Children are using the internet in di very diverse places, in private rooms, on personal media. So some of the advice we've been giving over the past few years, for example, that parental oversight is no longer um, is vital, is in many ways no longer practical. You cannot ask a parent anymore to look over the shoulder of a child. A direct engagement between the parent and the child is increasingly important, and that's something uh, I know many stakeholders are now thinking about. The internet is being used by ever younger children, uh, and the evidence shows that parents and primary schools are often unprepared. Much of the efforts in the last few years have been on secondary schools rather than primary schools, with parents of teenagers rather than parents of young children. Um, so parents in primary schools are often unprepared. Um, I'm glad that was you, Bill. <laughs> it wasn't you. You just look pink. So. <laughs> And 
And some of the ways in which we've uh, designed the affordances, for example, on social networking sites um, to be uh, specific particular age groups are not working. So the recommendation from the research would be to develop new age appropriate approaches to safety, as um, Deirdre also said, in terms of advising children on pornography use. Children's practices are evidently changing. Uh, one fifth of teenagers communicate with unknown others online. Uh, they want privacy. They often feel more themselves online. Um, we need to understand better what that culture is of youth and how it uh, evolves as the platforms evolve. Familiar risks persist. There's a fair bit of evidence now about the uh, rates at which children uh, report being cyberbullied or seeing harmful content or being exposed to pornography. And at the same time, there's evidence of new risks arising. So the rise of pro-anorexia sites, for example, I think, and the use of those is something that's received very little attention so far. There is increasing uh, attention to personal data misuse. And it's not surprising then that research shows that a substantial number of parents are worried. At the same time, we can also see that that stark situation of digital natives and completely ignorant parents is changing. And even though parents may be often behind children, they are catching up, they are using the internet, and the more they use the internet, the more their skills mean that they are empowered to, uh, um, to manage their children's internet use better. So we can see that more skilled parents results in better and more uh, targeted parental mediation of their children, and it also strengthens children's confidence that they can talk to their parents about what it is that might be worrying them. Uh, parents, I think, uh, are all less likely now to simply feel they have to turn off the computer and take it away. They feel that they might have some other tools. And so that, in that sense, parental um, use of the internet uh, and its positive benefits for parental mediation should be encouraged. One of the things that hasn't been talked about very much um, today so far is the question of vulnerability and what makes some children resilient and other children not so resilient to some of the risks that the internet affords. Um, so although teenagers we can see are encountering more risks, often they are resilient and research suggests it's the younger children who are upset, suggesting that parents, teachers and others should now be having some quite difficult conversations with younger children that previously they just had for teenagers. There's evidence about the way in which younger children especially lack the digital and safety skills that they need for using the technologies they are now engaging with. Um, pinpointing exactly where that vulnerability is is quite difficult. I think there's been a lot of anxiety about games and internet addiction. And um, not belying what, um, what Deirdre has just said, the evidence so far finds very low rates of addiction, though, of course, for those children, there um, is an interesting question about who might be supporting them. Some of the research is with offenders, um, which uh, is showing that grooming behavior is often very carefully planned, tailoring messages over time to target a specific child, but at other times quickly and opportuni opportunistically working through friends list to quickly identify a vulnerable child among the very many who are wisely saying, no, you know, I'm not engaging with you. Still, there's no typical groomer uh, and um, uh, advice that sort of characterizes the typical groomer again needs to be um, rethought, but maybe we're getting to a point where we can kind of map <coughs> types of offender and which children might be particularly vulnerable to different kinds of approaches. There's evidence that webcams and mobile phones are often used in the grooming process with nearly half of the reported cases of abuse occurring via webcam. We haven't talked very much about webcams and I think perhaps um, we should be talking more about webcams as well as smartphones as we think about what technologies um, are linked to particular kinds of risky online behavior. At the same time, there's lots of evidence which is rather um, encouraging. I think the considerable efforts that many here and more widely in this country have been putting in over the last few years are paying off. Uh, most children now say they do, know, know what to, they do know what to do in a threatening online situation. There's beginning to be evidence that safety training is making children more careful. But still, um, a very familiar problem of what children know and what they do in practice persists. So some tend to forget the safety rules when they're online and engage in risky behavior. And working to move beyond what children say they know, what they've learned, and when they put that into practice when faced with particular challenging situations is something that I think um, awareness raisers have yet to fully engage with. 
Um, again, a positive story. Uh, the research shows that UK parents lead across Europe in the use of filtering uh, end, end user filtering technology, but still that means that half of parents are not using, um, using filtering technology. We can see that filters are becoming more effective, but still there are gaps. The technology is, again, often ahead of the safety tools. So the filters are less effective for peer-to-peer -peer communication, for user-generated content, and for mobile use. So clearly those efforts to develop better parental tools and guidance are still very much needed. Again, there's um, evidence of better reporting systems and how that improves policymakers and the public's knowledge of the incidence of online risks, and some evidence that children find those reporting tools effective. So I think making those more widely available is a priority. In the use of filters and other, other forms of, of, of end user protection, so for example, um, British children are the most likely to set their social networking site to private, um, all suggest that safeguarding uh, efforts have been uh, effective. Of course, they need to be maintained, they need to be updated. And I think one of the interesting findings is that in schools, setting up those safety policies is often more effective and sustainable than um, keeping them going and evaluating them. So still, that question of balancing opportunities and risks is very difficult. Um, half of UK children say that parental efforts to keep them safe um, restricts what they can do online. There's a difficult balance between their um, opportunities and their risks. Um, we can see some evidence that the gap in what children and parents say about internet use and safety use is reducing. In other words, children and parents are beginning to understand each other better in relation to um, internet use. But still, there are lots of differences. And some of those words, what is, safe, what is safety, what is strangers, what is sexting, um, we can still see a divergence of views and understanding between children um, and parents and other adults. So, of course, um, more research is needed. Um, I think it's especially needed for younger children. Uh, and the parents and teachers of younger children uh, to understand what particular risks they face and how they are equipped or can be better equipped to deal with them. Uh, research has to keep up to date um, to address the latest technology. Um, we need still to be much better at uh, understanding the particular conditions of the vulnerable children whose parents are not necessarily doing all the right things or with the attention and the skills and the ability to uh, resource them and support them as we might uh, wish and there is some work uh, going on on vulnerable children and the evidence group hopes to have um, a seminar or a day uh, disseminating some of that work in the autumn. A sense that uh, some of the familiar risks are now being <coughs> relatively well researched but the emerging risks for example of user generated content or privacy and identity issues uh, again there's an area where research needs to keep up. And similarly, there is much more to be understood about the nature of the media literacy and digital skills that children and parents need, and also how those very needs are changing as children and parents have to cope with ever-changing um, risk environments. Um, in, the, in our work, the evidence group is very keen to embed the insights from evidence in the design of awareness campaigns, in the design of parental controls and other end user tools, and um, in the design and development of industry and government approaches to self and co-regulation. We, uh, of course, will continue to update the evidence base and anyone who knows of any research we uh, haven't yet um, discussed or uh, disseminated, uh, please do get in touch. And we've made everything available on the UKIS website. Thank you.